So the first question I want to ask you is about the general place of architecture in relation to philosophy. One of the things that I spoke about with one of my former colleagues, he was an analytic philosopher, and I asked him what was the thing which was the common denominator of all philosophy? Uh, you know, what did all philosophers do? And he said, uh, well, we make arguments. Uh, and logic is the common denominator of all philosophy. Being an analytic philosopher, he would say that. And the thought uh, I was, well, my thought that that was that we we do do that. You know, we're, we're worried, we like to make arguments. We're worried about the big sound and valid and uh, true and all of those things. And I was thinking, well, I'm more of a continental philosopher. I come through your Derrida as your Heidegger's. And I was thinking, well, the one thing that all, all philosophers think about that was presupposed by all philosophers is the question of being. And then all the other branches of philosophy, aesthetics, politics, ethics, jurisprudence, they're all subordinate to the question of being. So where does architecture come in on that? Is it usually the case that it's subordinate to aesthetics, I guess? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Certainly, I would consider architecture under the framework of aesthetics. And your friend raised a metaphilosophical question, uh, what is what does philosophy do? And yes, of course, for analytic philosophers, it's about making argument. For me, the great metaphilosopher is Alfred North Whitehead. And he says it's not really about arguments because people make bad arguments all the time and you discover the flaw in your argument and you fix it. It's not that big a deal. Sure. For Whitehead, it's about adequacy and coherence. Adequacy in the sense that philosophy is the one field that has to talk about everything, potentially, it has to be able to account for everything in the universe, at least in principle. So there's that. And in terms of coherence, it's just that the parts of the philosophy have to fit together. Although for Whitehead, that's a, a goal rather than a starting point. If you're worried too much about consistency at the beginning, you're probably flattening everything out to fit your theory. So I like leaving lingering inconsistencies for a while and then fix them when I need to. And then as far as architecture, well, as you know, in my book, the way I approach it is by looking at Kant, who is maybe the central figure in aesthetics for the past couple of centuries with his critique of judgment. And he has a very low opinion of architecture um, because for Kant, architecture is unforgivably contaminated by the fact that it's useful. That that destroys <laughs> destroys its purity for Kant. We wouldn't want that, Graham. Yes, right. <laughs> so uh, that was my starting point because I had this intuition that he's simply wrong, that architecture has a, a lot to add to aesthetics and also then to philosophy. There's also the interesting fact that architecture has been very open to philosophy, certainly over the past half century and even longer than that, whereas our, uh, philosophy has not been that open to architecture, partly because uh, it can't be. There's not really a way. Uh, philosophy in its present state isn't really equipped to learn that much from architecture. And so that's another problem I was looking at. What is it about philosophy that makes it, it unable to learn anything from architecture? There's the, a third interesting fact, which is that the three most influential philosophers on architecture in the past half century, in order, Heidegger, Derrida, Deleuze, uh, none of them really knew architecture. Building Dwelling Thinking by Heidegger is an interesting essay, and architects like it, but it's clear that you know, Heidegger didn't really know who the main architects were or what their significance was. Derrida was kind of taken by surprise by architects' interest in him, as I was. And of course, uh, Derrida engaged personally with Bernard Schumi and Peter Eisenman, but I, it didn't seem that he really knew the whole history of, of the fields. You know, Deleuze obviously engaged with the Baroque for writing the folds. But again, you don't sense that Deleuze really polymath, though he was in some ways. You don't sense that he really knew the whole field and its history. I can't say that I do either, but I've made that effort since joining uh, an architecture uh, school. What I wanted to ask next is, uh, yeah, so that does make sense to me because of the other thinker that does talk about architecture post Kant would be Hegel. And what does he do? He puts it in the his lectures on aesthetics, he does write extensively enough on it in there. Or he's got a long pa passages on it. But again, for Hegel, uh, architecture is very much subordinate to the development of spirit and the concept and all of these things. So I can I can see what what you mean, and I think that's what you're trying to do in your in your book. And congratulations on that, by the way. It's uh, it's it's a lovely edition and it's a lovely book. You're saying that architecture is first philosophy almost, or it can be first philosophy in a way, in a way that we could elevate it to its own branch of philosophy, perhaps. Would that be fair to say? It would be fair to say. Of course, for object-oriented ontology, triple O, aesthetics is first philosophy, and uh, in a wider sense of aesthetics than usual. Aesthetics has to do with the way that objects have a loose relationship with their own qualities and how that makes possible causality as well as aesthetic experience as we know it. And then architecture, uh, you know, every aesthetic theory has usually taken one genre of art as its 
paradigm. You know, in Kant's case, it's literature, in Nietzsche's case, music, in um, Stanley Cavell's case, film. And so you all intermittently you see one genre of art come to the forefront in different theories of aesthetics. The reason it's become architecture for me is precisely because of what Kant missed in it. I'm, I'm more interested in Kant's aesthetics than, than Hegel's because I am enough of a formalist in a modified sense uh, that Hegel can't really help me on that front because as you pointed out, everything passes into everything else. And finally, spirit as well. Uh, I like about Kant the fact that the artwork has to be cut off from a conceptual paraphrase, from socio-political surroundings. And I think there's a limit to how far you can go with that. As I argued in Art and Objects, I don't like what the old formalism does. I think you have to modify it. But I like enough the fact that it, it's about things being cut off from other things because that's totally out of fashion in philosophy now, except in Tripolo. And Hegel can't really help you explore that. The problem with Kant and architecture is that there's no reason that use usefulness spoils things. That comes from Kant's prejudice, which is shared by Michael Fried, our wonderful art historian who's thankfully still alive and who I admire very much. Uh, their formalism relies on a specific separation, which is that between the human and the non-human object, uh, which is why Fried can't allow, Kant wouldn't have allowed, all these 1960s genres such as performance art and conceptual art, uh, because they illegitimately combine the human artist with the non-human piece of stuff that's involved in the art. Whereas uh, for me, that's just another object, right? It's it's easily possible to make hybrid objects that include a human plus a piece of physical stuff. And that hybrid can be cut off from the rest of the world. Well, my next question was really general and basic. Yeah, so what one of the things that you're working with professional architects, so you, you work at SciArc, Southern California Institute of Architecture, I got that right, I think. And the, the question is a really banal pedagogical question, Graham, is what is it like working and teaching architecture students? And what is it like teaching them philosophy as well? It's an interesting experience. Uh, they, you know, SciArc, I should say, for listeners who don't know what it is, I didn't know what it was until 10 years ago either, because it has a it has a low profile outside of the architectural world and, and outside of Los Angeles. Even in Los Angeles, some people don't know what it is. So it's very well known in the architecture world. Top five program by many accounts, uh, but not well known outside architecture because it it's exclusively an architecture school. Um, we're thinking about opening it up so that there are some degrees that aren't for practicing architects, but that's a work in progress. And so I first heard about it, yes, 10 years ago, which was early in my self-education in architecture. And then four years later, I was working there. It's funny how life happens. And so, yeah, all of my students are architecture majors. They are mostly undergraduates. Some graduate students take my electives. And so there's a lot of introductory teaching just introducing them to the basics of philosophy. I tend to teach quite a bit of aesthetic related material in um, in the electives. And lately I've been teaching, in order to diversify our curriculum, I've been teaching Islamic philosophy, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy to diversify our offerings. Because all those interest me. And uh, the different experience is that reading isn't the primary activity of these students. You know, humanities students like to read. We do, we do. We've been known to crack a book open. Yes, architecture students are well informed and architects tend to be aware of what's out there, but architecture students do not have a lot of time to read. Uh, they're in the studio most of the time, breaking their backs, pulling all-nighters. And so you have to have your readings be a little shorter and more to the point. You have to choose your readings a little more differently, I would say. Gotcha. But they are rather skilled in oral presentation and intellectually omnivorous. And so there's a lot of pl aesthetically skilled, obviously. SciArc in particular an architecture school that focuses on design on actual interesting design, formal shapes and structures that are of interest. So there are a lot of real talents uh, that are new to me among the students because it's just a different kind of student. Having colleagues around is fascinating because I can pick their brain every day and then there are visiting speakers almost every week that I can learn from. And then we have a library that's not large, but it's, of course, completely focused on architecture. And so uh, I was able to write my book simply by using the, the SEAC library in most cases. There are enough resources there to go from zero to 60 miles an hour pretty quickly. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's one of the things is the the intersection of philosophy and architecture, which your, your book, well, I think you're one of the people who's calling that into being, really. And it must be very exciting. I was thinking, you know, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk to you about today, I was thinking it must be very exciting because you're, you're, in, you're, you're engaging with students outside your home discipline. But you're you're engaging 
you're teaching future architects and that's going to have very very concrete no pun intended uh, concrete outcomes you know the people these are the future builders they will in some way down the line you're going to see triple o influence buildings that must be very very well gratifying well we'll have to see what happens um there are already some triple o influence designers more of my own age group it's always hard to predict what the the ensuing generations are going to to gravitate towards i tend not to teach my own work just because i've always been shy about that uh, i'm not always sure it's appropriate finally because of student requests i taught a triple o seminar last spring and that was interesting i interspersed that with architectural writings that were associated with triple o and once in a while, I'll st- I'm going to stick a chapter of architecture and objects in my class this fall uh, because it's relevant to the class I'm teaching this fall. But otherwise, I'm, I'm going out of my way not to um, indoctrinate because I don't. Th- that's not my job. Sure. No, it's the direct opposite of teaching, Graham. I think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Getting more into the weeds about the links between architecture and philosophy. No, I think the the, the 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 figure that I don't think we could bypass, least of all because he is so influential you, and that's Martin Heidegger. And Heidegger's essay, Building, a Dwelling, Thinking. And that is a, it's a very enigmatic essay, no doubt. And it's a good example of the later Heidegger, I suppose. Heidegger's, you know, that late, very ocular pro style he had. But at his core, I think there is quite a simple idea. And that is, we have forgotten how to dwell or how to live well with our abodes. And we have started to think of our homes as technological and instrumental rather than existential and he pointedly notes this in the essay if i'm if i'm if i remember correctly he says so not every building is a dwelling for example so he says some buildings like football stadiums or railway stations or swimming pools and supermarkets are not in themselves dwellings sure people can you know i was thinking was there any exceptions to that today and i was thinking maybe you know in the united states when hurricane katrina happened people had to you know shelter in that massive uh, stadium but that's more of an exception rather than the rule i suppose Mm -hmm. well one would hope (laughs) yes well of course with dwelling as with every major heideggerian concept uh, the key is that it involves some kind of openness to what is hidden anything that can be calculated anything that become can become present on the surface is for heidegger a anathema that's what dwelling is for me, and I think for Heidegger. It's, it's, he, there's always a certain kind of mysticism of place in Heidegger. There's something about a special place. And so Christian Norberg Schultz's book, Genius Loci, picks up that aspect of Heidegger and uh, talks about uh, three places, Prague, Rome, and Khartoum, and what is interesting about each of those three places as places. So he's pushing Heidegger in that more concrete direction. Because you do that in the book, you talk about sort of the big three philosophers, your Heidegger's, or phenomenological architecture, Deleuze, Derrida, and Derrida's influence on deconstructivist architecture. I'm interested specifically for you in terms of architecture, what you appreciate about the building daily thinking essay and how you depart from it in the development of your own specific triple O thinking on architecture. Sure. If there's anything I appreciate in the in that article, it's simply what I appreciate about Heidegger more generally is attention to that which is not present at hand. Heidegger and Derrida are both critiques of presence, but people miss that the critiques are completely different. For Derrida, not only can a thing not be present, it also cannot be absent as self-identical, because that is a form of presence for Derrida. He calls it self-presence. So it's essentially a critique of identity in Derrida's case. Uh, No such thing in Heidegger. For Heidegger, it's perfectly fine for a thing to be withdrawn and identical to itself. Being is withdrawn. Contra Derrida, being is not just something that manifests itself historically and is only seen in its various manifestations. Being is something over and above that for Heidegger. Uh, What I critique both Heidegger and Deleuze for in the book architecturally is that neither of them has a good way of articulating the depth In Heidegger, being is not only that which hides, but he has a tendency to make it a one. He has a tendency to consign the plurality of entities to the surface. He doesn't do that as explicitly as the young Levinas, who who says that prior to human hypostatizing of things, uh, there's just this rumbling ilia, or there is. But that's the young Levinas. Heidegger never comes out quite and says that. But if you if you follow his works, that's what's entailed by his works. For instance, Earth. Earth, for Heidegger, is that which hides in the artwork. You can't really speak of multiple Earths in Heidegger. There's no The way he describes it, there's no real room for that. The Earth is one thing. So there's this kind of underlying monism, underlying monism in, in uh, Heidegger's uh, philosophy that problematizes his application to architecture. And I think one of the ways you can see that 
is that phenomenological architecture, even though Heidegger is the inspiration, is actually more Merleau-Pontian in a way, because it's more about sensual experience. It's more about a softly turning silver handle on an oak door. That's how Peter Zumthor, one of the great phenomenological architects, maybe the greatest, describes his process of design. You don't get this sort of ominousness of a hidden being in phenomenological architecture. You get it, ironically, from uh, a work like Peter Eisenman's Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. And uh, Eisenman's a more Juridian. Very than striking piece, that, Jim. Yeah, and that's, that's where I think that's a little closer to Heidegger, even though Eisenman is more linked with Derrida. I don't think the phenomenological architects really... There, there are maybe too much about dwelling and not enough about angst, is, is a Heideggerian way to put it. There's not a lot of mystery in, in phenomenological architecture, and deliberately not, right? Deliberately, they want to place, play. yeah, space, space, yeah. Right, that's right. So uh, that's that's what I think the problem is with Heidegger's application to architecture, other than the fact that his lack of interest in the surface makes his aesthetic somewhat monotonous. I've compared him in the past to Clement Greenberg aesthetically, because for Clement Greenberg, of course, the, the surface content of a painting is trivial. He calls it literary anecdotes. The only role of the content for Greenberg in painting is to signal its awareness that there's a flat background behind it all. And so, the, the you know, for example, cubism, its content is designed to show its awareness that we are not attempting three-dimensional illusionism here. I, Picasso, am aware that I am working in a flat medium and Miro and all, all the other painters who uh, Greenberg most treasures in the 20th century, whereas, of course, he would despise any 20th century figurative painting because it's just reducing itself to storytelling. Well, Heidegger's got a bit of Greenberg in him there as well. Heidegger despises surface content in his own way. It's antic. Openness to the mystery of being is what Heidegger's about. So there's that built-in handicap uh, for his approach, not just architecture, but to aesthetics more generally. It's kind of a one-dimensional attention to that which is hidden. So um, that's that's what I would say about Heidegger and architecture. I've got other things to say about Derrida and Deleuze, but maybe you want to stick with this for a while. So my next question then is, well, one of the things that you talk about in your work is this idea of overmining, undermining, and duomining. Now, I hope I don't mangle this, but as I understand it, I take it to be overmining and undermining to be your shorthand for describing how philosophical theories, which you're trying to distance yourself from, work. So it's, the way I kind of do it is kind of like top down and bottom up. So like overmining would be of Platonism, say, where, you know, the the, the forms generate the, uh, the the properties of the world and undermining would be pericle materialism or something like that, where, you know, it's the, uh, things are reduced down towards the properties. And dual mining would be, and if I got this right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Graham, dual mining would be like sort of a mix of both where you'd have like, I don't know, like Hegel or something like that, or Marx perhaps. Where does, you know, when we're trying to think of architecture, or trying to think of a building, how does that work then? How does a building, just any building, it doesn't need to be, you know, just like a house or a, it could be a landscape, I guess, landscape architecture, or it could be a, a public function room, like a public, public building, like a town hall or a stadium or something like that. How does, how does architecture in a triple O way stop, you know, being subservient to, Overmining, undermining, and dual mining. I hope I got that right. Yes, and I would just point out that Western philosophy began with undermining because it was a series of attempts by the pre-Socratics to decide what was the fundamental element that everything is built out of, whether it's atoms or water or air, earth, fire, and water mixed. And it's really, for me, with Plato and Aristotle that some effort to escape that happened with their different senses of form. A great example for me of overmining would be em empiricism, like Hume's empiricism where all that exists are qualities and bundles of qualities, and we can't assume that anything exists below those, not even a self. And then the reason it's sometimes hard to tell who's an underminer and who's an overminer is because of the term dual mining that you mentioned. The inherent weaknesses of undermining and overmining mean that people tend to mix them in order to patch up holes in their preferred version. So, for example, in scientific materialism, it looks like it's undermining because everything's made of particles or whatever. But then in the end, these particles are mathematically knowable for them, which are it's a, it's a form of overmining. Now, when it comes to architecture, uh, the grain of truth in Kant's critique is that uh, architecture strays in the direction of overmining most of the time in, in two different ways. The key distinction in architecture, of course, has since the 1800s and even earlier, if you go back to Carlo Lodoli in the 1740s, I think, uh, form and function as the key 
two key terms. Now, it's obvious how function becomes overmining, because if, if you think the only purpose of a building is the function, or if you think the only purpose of a building is to help the poor, then you're missing something about buildings, right? You're missing the fact that the building is more than its purpose. If you, people can go back and read um, Architecture of the City, um, why am I forgetting his name? Anyway, it's called The Architecture of the City. Rossi, Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi, of course. <laughs> right. The, the, for Rossi, uh, buildings often have different functions than the one that they were designed for, like Cyarc, which was originally a train station, and then it became a kind of you know, collapsed homeless hangouts. And I met an Uber driver who bribed the homeless sometimes to leave and he'd hold raves in there. And then finally it became an architecture school. So it's had a lot of functions. Or uh, in the case of monuments, you have a lot of structures that never really had a definite function in the first place. And that's what Rossi calls his critique of naive functionalism, that you can't really, a building is deeper than its function. Okay, and that's easy enough to see. What's harder to see is that the architectural sense of form is usually overmining as well, because it usually refers to the visual look of a building. And there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, that's too relational, because it means how the building looks to us at a cert from a certain position. And the form of a building is deeper than that, because for one thing, unlike a painting, you see an architectural work from many different angles. You have to go through it on the inside. And so it's a temporal and even kinetic experience. And you have to weave these different visual looks together in memory. And somewhat surprisingly, it's the young Peter Eisenman who maybe writes best about this. He, t he talks about this in the early 60s before he reached his mature position about how architecture is a temporal art form anchored in memory. And that's why the young Eisenman thinks you need basic geometrical forms to, to make your memory of the building uh, manageable. So in the book, I'm trying to go beneath the overmining versions of both form and function. And in the case of function, I do that largely through Rossi's argument. Also, by way of a very interesting critical essay that Jeffrey Kipnis wrote on Rem Kohlhaus and his failed design for the, the Tate Modern in London. Rem Kohlhaus had a very influential, though failed, design in the competition for the Tate Modern. And Kipnis criticizes this by saying if it had won the competition, it would have destroyed architecture as we know it, because it's not really an architectural project. It's an infrastructural project designed to circulate the most number of people through in the fastest amount of time. And it didn't really have to be an art gallery. It could have been anything. It's just a high performance technical object, although he concedes that it would have been a fantastic venue for looking at art. Now, I see this more as a positive. I, I see this as Kohlhaus's way of derelationizing function, derelationizing relation. So it has a function, but it's not tied to any specific function. It's flexible in a way that Rossi would have liked. It's monumental in the good sense, because it's not too tied to the narrow confines of the, the Tate Modern project. And as if to emphasize this, the, the uh, design brief for that contest insisted that the smokestack of the old power plant had to be kept, as of course it was. In the, in the current tape, and uh, as if to impishly uh, play with that constraint, Kohlhaus's design reduced the smokestack to the metallic framework of it. So it was like this metallic skeleton of a smokestack, which is almost his way of saying, no, I'm, I'm as Kipnis puts it, he hacks away at the muscle and the skin of a design brief and leaving only the nervous system. And I, I like that description by Kipnis. I see that as a positive thing. I see that as a way of subtracting inessential detail from the project but you try to get to the essence, I guess, because yes, function cannot be primary, can it? You know, because if a building functions changes, you're asking in a very, I'm thinking in a very Aristotelian way, what's the essence over time? You raise this point in the book itself. You say architecture is intelligible only through time. And I don't think you mean a subjective experience of time there, as in, I don't know, it took me half an hour to walk around the Sydney Opera House or something like that. But I think I'm well, semi-quoting you here. Uh, you said the parts of a building are spread out in time so all at once, that's what you're trying to articulate. The, well, the form, the form is primary there. The essence is primary. That's right. And of course, there are other arts that are temporal, like novels and cinema. But in those cases, you have to go through it in the order that the author intended. Now, an architect can suggest certain ways that the building should be approached. And often the entrance is required because there's only one entrance. But you can explore, you can move backwards as you're exploring a building. You can linger in certain places. And for me, that's a large part of the experience of architecture. It shouldn't be too easy. It should take some memory work and some temporality to experience a building. And I give in the book the example of two works by Frank Gehry, the famous uh, Guggenheim and Bilbao, which I've seen, and then also the less, somewhat less famous Louis Vuitton 
building in Paris, which I've also been to. And of course, the Guggenheim is a masterpiece, but it's really only a masterpiece on the outside. When you see photos of the building, you're rarely going to see photos of the interior because it's fairly boring. People go inside, of course, because they want to see what it's like, but they tend to leave fairly quickly because the floor plan is pretty simple. There's not a lot going on. It, the thrill of that building is from the outside, where it's so unusual. And of course, as if to emphasize that, it's surrounded by sculptures like a Louis Bourgeois spider and a Jeff Koons flower puppy and a couple other Koons pieces. And so it's all, the building is almost more like a sculpture to me. It's almost like something seen from the outside in three dimensions. And when people, when architects praise it, they are usually left to praise its interaction with the rest of the city, like how it interacts with the bridge that it's next to and with the river and with the part, the old part of Bilbao across the river. And I think in part that's because they instinctively sense that it's too much of a sculpture. And so they have to relationize it to save it from that fate. Whereas the Fondation Louis Vuitton building in, in Paris is also quite fascinating on the inside. There are a lot of surprises on the interior. And so the, ex building, the, sorry, the experience of the building is both interior and exterior and held together in memory. And that's more the kind of architecture I like to see. There has to be some complexity in it, requires things being woven together by the architect that don't seem to belong together, but in a believable way. That point about inside and outside is, is interesting because just two miles down the road from my house in uh, Manchester in northern England is the Imperial War Museum North. The architect is Daniel Lipskind and that to me is and he's also the uh, he's also the architect I think of the Holocaust Museum in Berlin um which is a very impressive building. Yeah, so that building is very it's uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's kind of a like a deconstructed globe. So it's a war museum and it's it's like it's like the globe basically shattered and sort of reconstructed in a kind of a modernist way. And he's his his the point is that it's, you know, the war fragments the world, I think, is what the what what he's trying to express there. And but when you go inside, it's like you know, again, I'm not very literate in these things, so I may be doing the architect a disservice. Indeed, I'm definitely doing the architect a disservice, but I didn't find it as impressive. <laughs> this speaks to your point, Graham. It's all surface and no substance, I guess. Hmm. Liebeskind, of course, is usually identified with the deconstructivist trend in architecture. Right. Maybe this is a good time to shift towards Derrida since we've done. Let's right. do it. Well, Derrida was somewhat taken by surprise by his entry into architecture, as I was, for that matter. I was approached <laughs> by architects and told Triple O was interesting for architects and was shocked by it. Bernard Schumi was Derrida's original contact, and later he became close to Eisenman. They had a bit of a falling out. And Yes, and Eisenman went on in psychoanalysis, I believe, as well, didn't he? Or he, he yeah, he, he was influenced by psychoanalysis of Eventually. Quite a, as, as I mean, also Chomsky at different periods and maybe a little Deleuze. So he's had, had several phases yep. more associated with with Derrida than any other philosopher. For sure. But uh, 1988 is when the deconstructivist show happened at the MoMA in New York. And it's probably the last canonical show in architecture I, that I certainly the one that I can think of. The, the last show where people thought, wow, that was a landmark event that with implications for the whole profession. Now, obviously, Derrida had a lot of influence on it. What's interesting is that if you get the catalog, which used to be hard to get, but now you can get a, a cheap reprinted paperback on Amazon pretty easily and affordably, I'd recommend anyone interested in architecture and philosophy to read that catalog. I believe there's not a single reference to Derrida in the entire catalog. Instead, they emphasize in the catalog the Russian constructivism side of it, referring to the avant-garde Russian art and architecture movement of around the First World War and early Bolshevism. And I'm not sure why that is, because Mark Wigley, one of the co-curators, wrote a whole book on Derrida and his PhD was on Derrida. I'm guessing that Philip Johnson, his then elderly co-curator, probably wanted to de-emphasize the philosophy side of it. You get that in architecture. You get some pushback against philosophy. Some people seem to resent the idea that philosophy is legislating somehow to architecture, which is ironic because that's never really happened. Philosophers have not known about architecture to legislate. So you get a lot of architects these days saying we should focus simply on internal disciplinary craft. The problem with that is architecture is already so open to every other field. Why artificially block philosophy from that? Philosophy and architecture are very different fields, but they overlap on one question, which is what is the nature of reality? My friend and colleague David Rue has said, rightly so, that architecture is our gives us our first sense of reality. It is very, very rare that humans are on a pure piece of nature with no human landscaping or no no signs or no. We we inhabit architectural spaces. 
And so that's why architecture is so important to us. It's the human's first sense of reality. So that goes back to my first question. Architecture is ontological in, in degrees. It's it's a sense of creating yeah. the spaces and the kind of arrangements of objects and peoples. Yes. And of course, animals create their own environments too, as do plants. Uh, all life forms have to engineer their own environments to their own advantage. And so humans are no different in that sense, that we, we inhabit this kind of bubble that we created ourselves. So coming into contact with non-human nature is rare. You might need the James Webb Space Telescope telescope to do that. And even in that case, we're coloring it in ways that human eyes can appreciate and things like that. So anyway, the, the 1988 deconstructivism show, one of the things that's so remarkable about it is how well they chose the architects. Everyone they chose for that show is a star in some sense. It doesn't include all the major architects of the last 40 years, but it includes a lot of them, a lot of the most famous ones. You've got Gary and Wolf Pricks and Liebeskind and Eisenman and, and Zaha, late Zaha Hadid. They're, they've all gone on to great prominence. And they were all pretty young at that time. So the curators chose wisely, even though you couldn't say that those architects have all continued to work in a deconstructivist vein. That's that's somewhat passe, but they all fit together at the time. There was something um, disorienting about the forms in that show, uh, a sense of disruption, a sense of fissuring, a sense of the world turned on its side or turned upside down. You had skyscrapers laying horizontally. You had cracks in buildings. You had yeah, as was- Eisenman does that, doesn't he? Eisenman does that like, you know, he puts pillars on the sides and things like that rather than up. Yeah, I have a high regard for Eisenman, especially as a theoretician. My gripe with Eisenman as an architect would be that he tries too hard to undercut function as his way of getting beyond the form function distinction. He says architecture is about form. It's not really about function. And to prove that he makes the function function less well. And I see that I call that functionalism with a sad face instead of a smiley face. Uh, That's not the way to, to undercut function. Uh, the way to undercut function is to make it non-relational, but that's he might have a counter argument for that. I'd have to argue it with him. But so anyway, that's what deconstructivism is about. And there are problems with that, too, just as there are with Heideggerian uh, architecture. And one of the problems is you can't really make a whole city out of existential crises, as I put it in the book. It's hard to imagine a deconstructivist school of urban planning because, <laughs> yes, it's disrupting or, or unsettling you at various points, but you can't have that everywhere. Right. That has to have to be one off monuments. Um, Aristotle said this very well when he was talking about metaphor. He's saying that not every part of a statement can be a metaphor because then you have a riddle. And he gives that hilarious example of I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire. And you're thinking, what the heck does that mean? It's a riddle, right? What it, apparently it's referring to an ancient Greek medical pr- uh, procedure of cauterizing a wound with hot bronze or something like that. But when you say I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire. No one has any idea what it's about. And so a metaphor needs a lot of literal ballast around it to make the metaphor work. Not everything in your urban environment should be a shock or unsettling. That should be used rather restrictively. So that's one of the problems with that school of architecture. The other problem is, again, as with you mentioned feeling not a lot of depth in uh, Liebeskind's Imperial War Museum North. I haven't visited that, so I can't comment on that. But Derrida is a philosopher who is systematically opposed to depth. Depth is a superstition. In fact, he tries to read Heidegger as not really being about depth because he wants Heidegger to be Heidegger to be his ally. That's a hopeless effort because Heidegger is all about depth and what's hidden. But for for Derrida, it's all about the play of the surface, the play of signifiers. I would summarize by saying I think there's a limit to how far the play of signifiers can take you in this world because the world isn't just about signifiers. And that might sound like a vulgar critique of Derrida, but I'm summarizing this for a podcast. And I think that's a concise way to put it. And that uh, the same problem occurs in architecture. You need that depth element in architecture because there is a reality. So much of our language as well is to follow on the thought, the thread of a metaphor. So much of our language is is architectural. We talk about foundations or having a foundation or having a strength and depth or, or things like that. It's about, well, it goes back to your point, I suppose, that architecture is or give us, gives us our first sense of how reality is in question at the very least or what the nature of reality is. Uh, yeah. Now, one of the other things I'd like to ask you is, yeah, you have a book called Immaterialism, and this might give you an opportunity, I think, perhaps to talk about uh, Deleuze as well, who's the other uh, thinker that you uh, refer to in, in, in the work. And when you say immaterialism, I don't think you mean like uh, spiritualism or supernaturalism, but you certainly don't mean materialism, I think. But architecture, you know, one would think of it as a very material pursuit. You know, you need to make buildings, you need masonry and materials and wood and grid and concrete and iron and engineering and all of the all of those things. So I'd be interested to see what your take is on 
the relationship between architecture and materialism? Sure. Um, I'm opposed to the word materialism for a very specific reason, which is I don't believe in matter. I think everything's a form. And I think part of what matter has done through the history of philosophy is it has served as a prop for the idea that you can take a form out of an object and bring it into the mind unaltered. You know, so there's there's a green in the physical thing and I somehow pull the green out and bring it into my mind without bringing the thing. And I think that's philosophically false. I think what happens is you're transforming the green when you bring it. You're, there is, as Bruno Latour puts it, there's no transport without transformation. And this is the main reason I'm opposed to matter. Uh, no one's ever seen it. Um, there's no such thing as formless matter. Matter becomes this kind of philosophical crutch people use when they don't want to talk about what happens to forms when you move them. They say, oh, right, right now it's inhering in matter, and now it's not. We took it out of the matter. No, that, that's not how it works. And so I just think there are forms wrapped in forms. Kant talks famously about the difference between 100 real dollars and 100 imaginary dollars, and he claims it has to do with the position of those for the mind. I would say no. I would say the forms are different in those two cases. Uh, the, the dollarness of the real dollars is not the same as the dollarness of the imaginary dollars, and I haven't worked that out in print yet. But that's how I would go after Kant and after his critique of the ontological proof of God. I think he's misunderstanding what happens there. I know it sounds crazy to say that Kant is misunderstanding something. <laughs> this is something analytic philosophers allow themselves to do this. So I'll, I'll be an analytic philosopher for a second and say Kant makes a, an unsound argument, which <laughs> Kant, Kant, continentals never like to do because we like to treat our heroes with reverence. So, yeah, that's why I don't like matter. When I talk about immaterialism, I'm not talking about a Barclayan position where everything's just an image uh, arranged by God somehow. I'm talking about the fact that everything that exists has different forms, and that's what makes it different. Forms wrapped in forms wrapped in forms. So I have nothing about against concrete and physicality in, in the building process or anything else. I simply wouldn't want to describe it in terms of matter. And this is why I'm not really on board with the new materialists, though I admire them for what they've done. They've created a whole philosophical school that's that's changed the terms of debate. I think the new materialists are one of the most interesting schools in philosophy today, but I can't get on board with them because I don't believe in matter. And so that's that's an insuperable difficulty between us. Deleuze is hugely influential on the new materialists, and he's one of the people that you engage with and respectfully, but you also deviate from in the book. Deleuze, again, Der Deridian influence on architecture peaked in 1988 with the deconstructivism show. 1993 seems to be the year when the tide turned in architecture and the architectural avant-garde switched to Deleuze, which, by the way, that's a couple of years before it happened in philosophy. I started noticing the Deleuzian way. I think it was earlier in the UK, but in, the, in, in North America, it was 94, 95, around in there when Deleuze started becoming more hip than Derrida. I went to a conference in 1994 where kind of un two unknown graduate students gave a Deleuze panel and the room was packed. And that's when I realized Deleuze had arrived. Because when I started graduate school in 1990, he was just kind of this fringe, almost comical figure like Baudrillard. He wasn't taken seriously the way Derrida and Foucault still were in 1990 by comparison. It took, took a half a decade for that to happen after, after I started graduate school. But it started a couple of years earlier in architecture. And uh, there were several figures involved. Sanford Quinter is, is one of the main ones, Canadian theorist in New York, John Rackman, and also um, Jeffrey Kipnis deserves some of the credit. But then Greg Lynn became almost the emblematic architect of this movement. Greg Lynn, who was probably in his late 20s by then. He's not that much older than I am. And Greg Lynn started talking about um, how he was getting tired of the uh, discontinuous aesthetic of deconstructivism already. And he wanted a smoother one. That He wanted more, more gradual curves. And he wanted mixtures that weren't quite purees or weren't quite filled with chopped nuts, but were something in between. And that led him ultimately to his signature form of the blob. And so the Deleuzian way was then fully underway. Architecture became about gradients. It became about relation rather than about abrupt cutoffs. And it ultimately became about a kind of continuity between the building and the environment. And so it fed into the the carbon footprint and the environmental blending capacity of the building. And David Rue, actually, uh, my colleague and friend, struck a kind of first counter blow to that in 2012 in an article uh, called Returning to Strange Objects, in which he said that the architectural object is being lost by all this gradualism. My generation of architects, and as mentioned, I'm born in 68, so I'm 54 years old. Architects around my age grew up as Deleuzians in the 90s. They grew up as the first practitioners of the paperless studio, meaning that computers were taking over in the 90s for the first time in the history of architecture. And so at mm. first, that computer phase where they thought computers were going to solve all the design problems, they realized in a few years that wouldn't happen. And then they tired somewhat of Deleuze, many of them. And I think Triple O was there for them as 
providing a counterweight as a language of discontinuity, a language of hiddenness, a language of the autonomy of form. And what I will always love about Deleuze is his irreverence. I love that from the first time I read him, which was Anti-Oedipus in 1990. Yeah, that is, that is fun, yeah. Yes, we, need, we needed more of that. Uh, where he loses me sometimes is I think sometimes he gets lost in a kind of continuous polemic against the French Academy and its conservatism. And so he kind of bends over backwards to privilege the thinkers who aren't at the top of the canon, right? It's, it's the Stoics and Spinoza and Duns Scotus instead of Kant and Hegel and, and Aristotle and Plato. And that was interesting for a while. But what's happened is you've got this whole generation of students who followed him too closely in that and are still trying to defend the minor figures. And so we've lost what's great about Plato and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and, and Kahn and Hegel, who really are the backbone of the history of philosophy. And so I think we need to return to those figures and their lessons. But ultimately, my philosophical problem with Deleuze is the idea that the virtual is both heterogeneous and continuous. That's one of the favorite mantras of Deleuzeans. In the end, heterogeneity versus continuity is a real problem in human thoughts. It's really hard to reconcile those two. You can't just stipulate that you've solved it with something called the virtual. Um, I'm writing a book, not finishing up a book now called Waves and Stones, where I talk about the continuous and the discontinuous in human thoughts in areas such as evolutionary theory, you know, punctuated equilibrium versus Darwinian gradualism. There's going to be a mathematics chapter on the continuum hypothesis. I'm talking Sounds exciting. About, yeah, I'm a little overdue on it, but I, I'm really finishing it up right now. And it's a real problem. That's a real paradox. And some wave particle duality, you can't just solve it by fiat and say, oh, I've got this thing called the virtual that solves it or that something pre-individual and protoplasmic that's somehow not quite individual and yet it leaves room for individuals. Architecturally speaking, Deleuze has never really allowed people to articulate buildings very well. There's this kind of smoothness and continuity. And uh, you see this, for example, in Patrick Schumacher, who was Zaha Hadid's right hand man and is still a Zaha Hadid architect. And although on the surface, Schumacher isn't really a Deleuzean, he's L Niklas Luhmann is his intellectual mentor. But he says some Deleuzean things in his giant book, The Autopoiesis of Architecture. He says that um, he says things like there shouldn't be corners on buildings. Uh, there shouldn't be any definite cutoff points as to function on the interior of a building and so forth. And then he, with disarming candor, which is typical of Patrick, he says, this does pose a, a huge problem for avant-garde architects, which is where do you put the apertures? Where do you put the doors and windows? Right. Honest admission of the problem. And, and as my friend David Rupp puts it, that's just the beginning, doors and windows. Architecture is all about articulating. And this is something that Deleuzean philosophy just isn't that great at. Um, you know, it might treat an articulation as a transient, transient, crystallization of an intensity somewhere, but that doesn't really work when you get down to nuts and bolts. You need some philosophical way of accounting for for articulation, for definite cutoff points where one thing bec simply becomes another thing and is no longer... Yeah, a wall is not a window. Yeah. Right? Mm. Well, I suppose you could have, you know, you could have a big wall, I guess, but the, the, I think the point remains a big glass wall. You know, I've, I've seen that in some buildings. But also, one of the things that you've suggested, uh, and maybe I'm sort of betrayed by sort of deconstructivist background myself here, which when you think of a, any building, say the building I'm in now, which is a typical semi-detached uh, suburban uh, house in the north of England, and... You know, we 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 think of the inside and the outside as separate. We we lock our doors, we close our windows, we we lock our houses when we go away. But in reality, there is a kind of exchange or there is a relationality. Now I don't think you'd pose it in those terms. There's sewage going in and out between the house. There's electricity, ca electrical cables. There's phone lines. There's internet. There's all of these things complementing uh, you know, the what we normally call inside and outside. I suppose. It's a more of an ecological question, that, isn't it? In what sense is the building, which I think is what you're going to say, separate or an essential form, separate from the its locus, its environment or its context? And I think that's important for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. There are individuals in the world and these individuals have to be cut off from the other things suitably. And this has to be clarified in such a way that humans can grasp it, which is not to say there aren't any flows or no, aren't any points of resonance between things, because of course there are. But that holism is false. Ultimately, everything is not connected to everything else. Things are cut off from each other. And so to return to Patrick Schumacher again, he, he tries to define architecture in his book as a way of framing communications. But that can't be true. It also has to be a way of framing non-communications. We don't want our bedrooms communicating with with the outside environment we, we want privacy we have blinds we we don't want sunlight and heat penetrating every area of our dwellings and we don't want slaughterhouses to be located in every part of the city indiscriminately right things have to be zoned off from areas where they would have an unpleasant impact articulation is what architecture is ultimately all about yes there are going to be relations accounted for in architecture but there are going to be some relations and not all relations
some relations are going to be chosen as as positive things, while others are going to be excluded deliberately. Wow, yeah, you just reminded me of sort of Robert Brandom's recent work there. So there's relations of compatibility and relations of incompatibility, I think. Although, obviously, I don't think what you're doing is Hegelian in any way, shape or form at all. In in, in your work, I, I think you touched on it briefly, but you didn't go to edit any extensively is the question of the environment, that ecological question. Of, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the Irish site, Newgrange. It's a archaeological a bit of an archaeological wonder really it's a Stonehenge monument in County Meath in Ireland it's li- it aligns with the solstice basically it aligns with the cosmos so on the winter solstice light enters into its uh, its antechamber and fills up the room to my mind that is a very I suppose again I'm betraying my phenomenological side here the, the idea is you know if you understand architecture it's it is in some way indexed towards its not only just its immediate historical context, but towards its towards the cosmos as a whole. So that would be, I suppose, where I try to try to struggle with sort of your 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 own perspective. Although I do appreciate what you're saying there, because Newgrange is Newgrange. You know, it's it's not like Stone Age. It's not the pyramids. It has its own unique cosmological place. Yeah, and well, that's just enough. Of course, that's what I'm talking about. Like, is how how do you think about the environment in relation to uh, building? We're certainly entering an ecological age. Everything's going to have to take the environment into account from now on, and that includes architecture. And students get a lot of that. They should probably get even more of that. But I also am on board with David Rue's concern. That it's going to simply architecture is going to be lost, and it's going to turn into what I call a worried ecology of the carbon footprint. And as with any function, you you can think of the need for environmental soundness in a building is just another version of functionality, an extremely important one, right? Serving a broader purpose known as keeping the human species alive. But just as with any function, the functional requirements underdetermine under determine the design. And there's this kind of moralistic tendency in our era to um, downplay the importance of anything, anything aesthetic, which of course Triple O is opposed to. These days, everything either has to be about the environment or it has to be about empowering someone who's oppressed. And those are usually the first angry questions you are asked when you do anything that isn't explicitly devoted to one of those two ends. But I would point out that those those are important requirements politically in our time, but they are not the only two things worth doing as a human being. What, what's important about aesthetics? What's important about aesthetics is otherwise we are surrounded by literalism, as I call it. And literalism is a false attitude toward the world. Literalism means the notion that a thing is nothing more than all of the qualities that we can truly ascribe to it. Basically, Hume's philosophy. David Hume is the great literalist, right? There are no objects. There are bundles of qualities. There's nothing hidden beneath that. But also, just as importantly, there's no object over and above its qualities. There's just a bundle. What Triple O is all about, people think of object-oriented ontology as being about hidden stuff, which which it is through its Heideggerian legacy, but that's only a quarter of it. What Triple O is really about is the innate tension between objects and their qualities. Objects gain and lose qualities all the time while remaining the same objects. Objects have some hidden qualities. Objects have some visible qualities. And that it's that tense relation between an object and its own qualities that aesthetics explores. Aesthetics essentially drives a wedge between an object and its qualities. And you can learn about this in several of my books, Object-Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything, Art and Objects, Architecture and Objects. I touch on this in all these books. That's what aesthetics is about. And so when people want to politicize everything, which these days means moralize everything, really, it means implying that somebody's a bad person if they're not focused on the carbon footprint and on finding out who's oppressed in any given situation. Those, For many people, those are the only two things worth exploring in any situation these days, but they're not. Aesthetic questions are vital. Frank Gehry, I think, said 99% of the built environment is crap, and he's right. <laughs> and that's a problem. That's not a minor issue. Santayana, the philosopher, pointed out that Beauty is a relatively small topic in philosophy, but it's a huge topic in everyday life. We're, we're making decisions constantly based on beauty, whether it's which way to walk to work or what shirt to put on in the morning, what hairstyle to get. Many of our, our decisions are guided by that, but philosophy has not taken it very seriously. When it comes to the question of power, which you've raised there now, I don't mean power in architecture in the sense like, you know, like Nietzsche might have, you know, the, a, a building is a, a node of power relations and, and, and they're overcoming and uh, under overcoming each other and they're constantly combating each other and so forth. I, th- I mean more in the sense that, and I don't think you disagree with me, that it's imparted at least to appreciate the ideological function of architecture or when it can happen. I mean, the last time you were on the podcast, you said something really interesting. You said that, you know, the the best philosophers are 
are those philosophers who are, you know, resisted to ideology, you know, so you get a Heidegger and they can be read in left wing, right wing ways, or you get left Hegelian, right Hegelians and so on. In architecture, that must be an issue as well then, isn't it? So, you know, the best architectures are not ideological architect. But then I think of someone like, say, I suppose Albert Speer or someone like that, you know, where you get the aesthetic very much concretized, you know, very much uh, architecturalized. I think that underlies your point that the aesthetic is absolutely essential to understanding the political. Yes, and of course, Speer is a very interesting figure historically, but I don't think anyone thinks much of him as an architect. It's kind of kitschy, neoclassical or romantic mixture. And of course, architecture has the special problem that philosophy does not have, which is that architecture is highly dependent on money, dependent on the wealthy and on corporations these days, because it costs a lot of money to design a building, right? The, The masses can't commission buildings in most cases. Whereas what I love about being a philosopher is I can be utterly impoverished and I can still write a philosophy book. Nothing can stop me. I just need paper. Especially these days. Yeah, that's right. So we have that advantage. We have that freedom, which doesn't mean we're completely free from ideology, but it means we don't need to cater to any particular wealthy class to do what we do, whereas architects have to. Cinema has a little of that, too. You can do low budget indie films, but, you know, Hollywood, of course, and people at that level of the profession are very dependent on other people and on money. So I think that's just one of the conditions of the profession. And some people try to moralize that, too, to the point of discrediting any architecture that was built for a corporation. But of course, a lot of buildings that are built in those situations are great buildings, right? It's the same as the Renaissance, you know, patronage. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, that doesn't bother me as much as some people do. I think there's always going to be a certain amount of political repression from one quarter or another. We try to minimize it, but it's not, it's not a religion to me to remove every last grain of oppression because I don't think it's possible. I think this happens anytime humans are in a society. They're going to be more powerful people and less powerful people. You just try to keep it from becoming tyranny or abject poverty for some of the people. So, I see that as just something that's probably always going to be part of the architectural landscape. You, you're never going to have a situation that I can imagine where people can just build buildings anywhere they want, anytime they want, regardless of how much wealth is invested in the project. There's always going to be a limit to what actually gets built. So you have to, architects have to find a way to negotiate that situation. And it's not a problem for me personally. I, I can sympathize with people. I had a colleague who uh, won the design for a competition in California but then had to spend most of the time out maneuvering a politician and some rival architects for it ever to actually get built. So that's that's just part of reality for architects, uh, having to use political charm and, and other things like that and, and propaganda sometimes for their project to win. Um, and so that's it's something architects are very aware of, the fact that they've always been connected to power. Vitruvius, the earliest surviving source, was working for Julius and Augustus Caesar. So there's the, the prime example right there. Um So I don't think you know maybe you could have left wing architecture that somehow draws on subscriptions from twenty dollar donors or something. I don't know, but it it seems very unlikely that that's going to succeed. Well, Soviet brutalist sort of architecture was very much sort of well, it was state driven, wasn't it? So it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like sort of a democratic ground up (laughs) swelling of uh, architectural building, right? Yeah, grassroots architecture is a hard project to to carry out. Of course, you don't want architecture to be openly ideological, but there are other great architects like uh, Tarani in Italy who was a fascist, one of Eisenman's favorites. And so it's like Heidegger, right? You can denounce the man as a Nazi, but he's still possibly the greatest philosopher of the 20th century. That's just something that happens. You can't demand political purity tests for all cultural figures. You can try to avoid repeating those mistakes. You can caution students not to admire the fascist side of Heidegger or not to admire those sides of his philosophy that paved the way for that, if we decide that there are any. So I think ideology is something to keep an eye on in architecture, but it's not... The connection with power and wealth is never something that's going to be gone. I think it's important not to be too moralistic against power because it's always going to be there in some form. And it's also a way of us philosophers perhaps, you know, saying that we're a bit we're lofty and above the the cut and trust of the body politic and, uh, you know, the, the, the dirty business of power and compromise and things like that. I've only got a couple of more questions for you, Graham. Uh, one of the things that struck me is, in the book is that you say that architecture is a tragic profession. And it reminded me of the film writer or the film director. They come up with a wonderful idea. They write a wonderful script. And then it gets mangled in the process of acting and editing and production and Hollywood and all of these things. And in some way, I think being an architect is similar, I think. Would that be fair? Seems like it, yes. As mentioned in the book, I came to Architecture Insider with maybe a couple of years of reading preparation, 
landed in an architecture school in 2016 and then had to get really serious about it at that point. And the, the first thing that surprised me, which will sound naive to architects, but I think a lot of non-architects think the same, is I always thought that architects get a commission, they design a building, and then they build it. Whereas that's not really what happens. First of all, most of the buildings you see on the street are not designed by architects. A very tiny percentage of the buildings you see are designed by architects. Most of them are construction companies using very banal but efficient templates, as I put it in the book. Then architects, architecture runs often on the competition system, and you maybe have a couple of weeks to put in your entry for the competition. You're pulling all-nighters. There might be a thousand or more entries, and there's four or five finalists maybe and one winner. And though they're supposed to be anonymous, that often doesn't happen, right? So let's say you get lucky. One of the fairy tale stories of all time, Jorn Utzon's Sydney Opera House, a beloved building, starts off in the discard pile for that competition. And then Errol Saarinen, who famously designed the St. Louis Arch in the United States, dug it out of the discard pile and says, oh, this is going to be one of the great buildings of the world. Good story, right? This guy's design starts off in the discard pile and ends up with this scene where a great architect is calling it a masterpiece. They start the project. It it has... Millions of dollars in cost overruns goes years beyond its scheduled completion date. Finally, the process became so frustrating that Jornotson resigned in protest and it was completed by others. So, yes, it's up. It's uh, one of the great buildings of the world, beloved by both the lay public and by architects in many cases. And yet it's not really what Utzon designed. And that's what I mean about tragedy. It's going to be hard to find cases where building went from the drafting room to the or the computer, I should say now, to completion without any huge disappointments. Or look at Zaha Hadid winning the competition for the Tokyo Olympic Stadium. And then it was taken away from her later because they thought it was too oh. obtrusive on the Tokyo skyline. That was that was a terrible tragedy for Zaha and Patrick Schumacher and the others in the firm. Very disappointing. But these stories like this are legion. And then so you have also some great architects who are paper architects for years or maybe forever and never get anything built or never get much built. Zaha was like that for a long time. Liebeskind was like that for a long time. And I know some architects who are, I think are fantastic architects around my age who still haven't built much or have built at all yet uh, because they haven't won any competitions, but they, uh, they're doing great work on paper. Maybe someday they get lucky. Now there is the academic path, especially for people who are especially avant-garde in their design ideas. You can, you can stay in academia and do very interesting stuff and influence others with your designs, even if you never actually build. But they all want to build, right? All architects want to see their stuff concretely embodied on the earth. But many of them never reach that point or don't reach it very often. Right, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe not so similar from ph- the philosophers then. My last question for you, Graham, is if you were to... I, will, I normally ask people to recommend something to read, but you've given tons of advice on things to read throughout the podcast, and I'll put links in the show notes. Do you have any advice on how to appreciate architecture for someone who's curious or even someone who's even a neophyte to the discipline? Any psychogeographical advice on how to appreciate architecture or our built environment? Yeah, I'm a reader, and so I tend to learn things from reading first, because if I just go look at stuff... I can get vague, instinctive impressions of what's going on, but I'm never really sure, right? So you could just go around and look at great buildings. And I'm sure there are lots of resources for that, from television programs to introductory books by architects who can tell you how to appreciate buildings. What oriented me theoretically best, I think, you you could read Marie's Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture simply because that's one of the key books where the fault line between modernism and what came after modernism appears. Because most people are familiar with what with what modern architecture is about. People know about the streamlined look of glass and concrete cubes and ornaments should be kept to a minimum. This is something we all have some sense of what it's all about. That started coming under fire in the 1960s, around the same time as the uh, mod- modernism and arts, visual art came under fire with pop and those sorts of movements. And Venturi, I find to be very clear in laying out what he thinks the problems are with modern architecture. If you want to first get a foothold in modern architecture, I think reading the Corbusier's Towards the New Architecture is the way to, the place to start, because that book is universally considered a classic. And if you're into reading more pages, you can read um, Siegfried Gideon's, is it Time, Space, and Architecture, something like that. Space, Time, and Architecture, I think it is. Yeah, it's a classic, but it's very long. That's another one. But I, I might just recommend reading the Corbusier's Manifesto Towards the New Architecture. Okay. I can't believe I didn't talk to you about Le Corbusier. <laughs> The Corbusier, the machines for living in. The Corbusier is for many the Picasso of modern architecture, the great Swiss architect. And those who don't like modern architecture usually attack the Corbusier. So he's kind of the the touchstone for modernism and architecture, both for good and for bad. There are other figures, of course. Anti-Heideggerian, I would almost say. Oh, he's utopian, rather. Yes. And then if you want to start looking at 
when that vision of architecture started to crumble, often people say three books, Aldo Rossi's Architecture in the City, Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, and then Manfredo Tafuri's uh, Histories and Theories of Architecture. I wouldn't recommend starting with Tafuri. And I love Rossi, but the subject matter is a little more constrained. I think Venturi is very accessible and gives you some idea of the broad scope of the things that he thinks are wrong with modern architecture. And he's had quite an impact leading both towards deconstructivism later and also towards historical postmodernism, which became kind of the dominant architectural form, 70s and early 80s, maybe. So that's reading wise. That's one thing you could do. I should say this, though. Uh, when I first got drafted into architecture, I asked my friend David Rue to give me 10 titles in recent art, 10 in classical architecture. It's just so I had 20 books to read so that conversations would start making sense to me. People often get intimidated by fields because they think, oh, I don't know anything about that field and all these other people know everything. Oftentimes you can get a foothold in a field by, I found reading seven or eight books. That's an, It's not enough to be an expert, of course. That's a lifelong project, but it's enough to have some idea what people are talking about and so, knowing enough so that you can learn from conversations. So in that case, I read 20 books at David's suggestion, 10 recent ones and 10 ancient ones and ancient and Renaissance and early modern ones. And that was enough for me to feel like, OK, I'm not completely lost here. I'm not going to make a fool of myself by asking questions at lectures now. I have some idea of, of what the different camps are, where this is all headed. And so, yeah, just finding a basic reading list. And there are many ways to do that. I can send one to somebody, the ones that I received. Uh, and then after that, I just kept reading and reading. I read anthologies of the history of architecture. I followed up leads on who the most important architects are, started looking at their buildings. Sometimes people rail against categories and isms in different fields. I like them. I find that they're the best way to organize knowledge in any field, to know that this person is considered a mannerist, right? And then you look at their buildings, you can sort of see why, or this person's considered Baroque. Start looking at their buildings and you get a sense of what that means. I don't think that's a negative thing at all. And then with more sophistication, you can start making more subtle judgments about things. And I'm still very much a student of architecture. I'm by no means a connoisseur of architecture. That's that's something I work towards slowly and maybe we'll never reach. But it's wonderful in middle age, especially to keep learning new fields. I've got another one now going, which is archaeology, because I've co-authored an archaeology book with Christopher Whitmore at Texas Tech. I've had to learn a bit about archaeology. And there are surprises every time you learn a field. Um, there are always preconceptions we have about any fields. So just keep educating yourself in as many fields as you can. It's the way to stay young. It's the way to stay excited about life. What a great way of place to be. Thank you very much, Graham Armand. All right.